You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs, Good Question Podcast. I have Thomas Purefoy. Uh, he's a producer, a writer, and a director. Uh, he was involved in the series called uh, Is Genesis History? And now he's working on a new documentary that uh, is going to go in deep about the Grand Canyon and uh, how it was formed, how long it took, et cetera. So welcome to the call, Thomas. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate the invitation. It's great to be here. If you would, tell me a bit about your, your background first. How did you get involved in these projects? Like, what was your past like? Well, you know, I got involved with the projects. Well, more recently, I got involved with the cause of my daughter. But I can go a little further back. I was um, went to Vanderbilt um, and ended up going to the Navy for a number of years. I was an officer on the uh, East Coast and amphibs uh, and special warfare and then ended up going into um, education. I worked overseas for a little bit as a missionary, as a teacher. And then also, I guess like before that, I'd been out in L.A. doing some screenwriting. So meeting a screenwriting school and trying to get involved in that world. So in the Lord's mysterious providence, he ended up putting me in Nashville, where I ended up ended starting my own little company a number of years ago. Uh, we ended up getting into homeschool education, which is our company, Compass Classroom. But about seven or eight years ago, I guess it would have been 2014, uh, my daughter, who was 10 at the time, uh, she really was starting to ask questions um, about creation and evolution. And she, what I realized is that she was asking questions I'd ask when I was, you know, 14, 15, I was teaching a youth group at the same time. So basically said, hey, I wonder if there should be, you know, a documentary that could explore this question of, of creation and evolution and what the Bible says in Genesis. And so that's what led me to pick up the phone and start to call some of these guys, Steve Austin, Andrew Snelling, a lot of these PhDs that had spent their lives sort of building up an argument for, um, to be quite honest with me, for a young earth creation view, a global flood. And I thought, well, great, let's try to do a documentary on it. And one thing led to another. And after a couple of years, we had his Genesis history. What was the reception when you guys first came out with this Genesis history? Was it a big acclaim or did you have a lot of pushback? You know, it's funny. We we didn't have a lot of pushback. I don't think anyone knew who, who we were. I mean, they, they probably still don't know who I am. But when it came out, we actually did a short form, a short, it's called a short release. I guess I think that's what they're called for, through Fathom Events. This is February 2017. And it ended up being the top film for Fathom that year. I think they had a theatrical piece I, that did a little better, a Broadway theatrical a release. But in terms of an actual uh, a documentary film or feature film, it was the highest grossing piece. And so it, there were a couple of encores. And then, you know, it's was for about many, many years on the top 10 Amazon DVD. And, you know, we I know we've had millions and millions of people around the world see it, whether through the theater or through DVD or now through YouTube and all the other places it's available. All right. What were some of the main questions that people had from the series or comments on it? Like what jumps out at you? Well, it's funny. I I think a lot of people were not aware of all this information. And, and, and part of what I wanted to try to do was to give a broad overview of just what these scientists were arguing. You know, it's the minority report. It's obviously a very specialized view that argues that, you know, Genesis is a reasonable book of history. And actually, if you start looking at the world around you, there's a lot of evidence that fits into that uh, paradigmatic structure that Genesis is arguing, sort of a model, if you will. And so my goal was to lay out sort of the, that 30,000 foot overview of all the pieces. But what we found, it was really funny. One of the first things we would hear is people would, it was released on Netflix and was on Netflix for a year. And people would say, yeah, I watched it 10 times. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, oh. the art, the, the documentary breaks a lot of rules. It's, it's all PhDs talking. It's lots of complex stuff. It puts one complex piece after the other. And so what, you know, it's not always easily understandable. What I realized is we got to realize people were like having to watch it five and six times to, they would hear something and say, now what is this? 
And they would come back and watch it again and watch it again. We started to hear tons of people telling us this. And so I I think this is probably a little long-winded and I apologize, I can be long-winded. So just jump in at any time and interrupt me. But I think the end result was that we had a, a huge number of people say, thank you. We'd never put all these pieces together or heard them before like this. And so, you know, it, it's been absolutely fascinating. We want to learn more. And so that's why we made lots and lots of other materials, you know, supporting it. But that was really kind of the the best thing we got was that uh, it was a lot of positive comments on it. I think the fact that people watched it multiple times, though, tells you that the information really hit home. It was important to them. And, you know, it's rare when someone doesn't understand something. They usually just give up. And the fact that people stayed the course and did that really is a powerful signal, I think. Well, it's here's my perspective on this. Is I, I feel like that there, for at least a couple hundred years, there has been sort of a view the history of the world that is, you know, it's incompatible ultimately with any kind of, of, of a biblical view. And this would be, you know, let's be honest, this would be Jewish, this would be Muslim, this would be Christian. So if you're going to take a Judeo-Christian view of the world for at least, you know, going back to Josephus and further back than that, you know, in terms of records that we have, people have held that Genesis is an accurate book of history. So when you start to look at what the you know, post-Enlightenment stuff did and what happened really in the 19th century in England. I mean, you go look at a book by Chambers, which was 1844, you know, the the vestiges of creation where he's presenting, you know, views of Lamarck and Buffon, which is a old, old earth, an old progressive development of life, kind of the nebula to man argument that people generally hold that view has kind of been held in ascendancy for quite a long time. But there are a lot of people who hold that, well, you know, there was Jesus talked about the flood and Peter talked about the flood and they talk about Adam and Eve, that the the two views of history are essentially incompatible. And there, you know, a lot of people have tried to make them work together. But I mean, to quote Lyell, who was an early geologist, he was like, look, we're trying to get Moses out of the rocks. Darwin, you know, he had his arguments with Asa Gray, who I think was an American. And Gray's like, look, can't we make this work with Christianity? And Darwin's like, yeah, no, I don't I don't think so. And you read their letters. And so I think that what has happened in the 20th century, in the late 20th century, is that people began to say, well, maybe there's a scientific reason for this, that actually this is a reasonable view and that there are a lot of areas of, of, of you know, neo-Darwinian evolutionary thinking that just doesn't really explain the complexity of the genetic record, um, and of the genome. It doesn't really explain the way all these things in our life and geology work. And so, well, yeah, one one thing uh, I remember listening to Stephen Meyer, and I don't think he's the only one that said it, but there's no intermediate forms in the fossil record. There's no half an eye, three quarters of a liver, you know, uh, two thirds of a bone type thing. So that that seems to lend a lot of credence to the fact that it wasn't slow over. You know, it was it was quick. It's it's a, the fossil record's a very strange thing when you get to look at it. But yeah, I mean, the idea when you start to see is. You know, this whole idea of um, essentially their stat, you know, equilibrium, their stasis, and then all of a sudden there's sudden change. And, you know, there was, quote, Kurt Wise, who worked with uh, Stephen Jay Gould, that he was his advisor. And Gould, of course, was punctuated equilibrium was his view of, you know, the evolution because he knew this. He knew what the fossil record was. And he said, look, there's this equilibrium is what we see in it. And then all of a sudden there's this it's punctuated by these sudden evolutionary changes. And Kurt was like, yeah, but that actually fits better in a, in a creation model. <laughs> like that, that it actually fits better that, that there's some flood model because the idea that this was not captured anywhere is really, really weird. And, and I think it's those weird things, things that like, well, that doesn't really totally make sense. It's the anomaly, uh, structures or the, the anomaly sequences that continue to build that makes one say, you know, maybe Genesis is, has a reasonable look at the world. It's just there are consequences if you hold that view. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, too. I, you know, I've seen a lot of people, and unfortunately, I've been one of them in the past, you know, making fun of religion. Those people are just brainwashed idiots, that kind of stuff. How do you deal with that? When And did you get a lot of that with this production? We did not get a lot of that. So part of my, part of my annoyance, so you make documentaries for different reasons. You know, I made one for my daughter, and I made one, well, there's three reasons. 
I would say I made it for my daughter. I mean, you know, everyone will do something for their child they probably wouldn't do for anyone else. Basically, to kind of answer her questions in a way. But I also was really frustrated. And I would read all these criticisms, these scientists, and they would say, oh, they're loons and they're crazy and they're dumb. And I was like, so you can say a lot of things about these guys. You may not agree with them, but it's wrong to say they're stupid. Like, I would never, ever say that someone that holds to an evolutionary view of the world is stupid. These are brilliant men and women who just have a different view. They're interpreting the evidence. And I may not think they're right, but you don't say they're dumb because that would be just wrong. Well, these creationists were totally, you know, excoriated by everyone. And so I really wanted to have a, a documentary where I was like, okay, just listen to these guys. And after you listen to them for, you know, an hour and 40 minutes, I don't think you're going to think they're dumb. And so that was a big deal. We did not get anyone criticizing us for being dumb. They said we weren't right, but they said they didn't say we were dumb. And then, of course, the third reason was this view of theistic evolution. BioLogos is a group that had been pushing, you know, theistic evolution among evangelicals. And I thought I saw more and more um, scholarly evangelicals, pastors kind of buying into this. And I was like, this is a crazy idea. Like this idea was. What what, what idea is it? What's the. uh, It's called it's theistic evolution. And so the idea I think they call now sometimes evolutionary creation. But what happened is there is a group um, in Francis Collins. He's the one that started this. And so BioLogos, they're a group that's out of where are they? Grand Rapids. And so they have pushed for years, pouring money. They get money from the Templeton Foundation, funded by millions and millions of dollars to basically advance an evolutionary view of the world among evangelicals. That's what they're funded to do. And you've got a lot of, you know, Christian smart folks that have kind of jumped on board. But I was like, I, I, this sign, this is like getting on a train that like is, is everyone else is getting off of it scientifically. And now all these evangelicals are jumping on board. And so I felt there needed to be a presentation to evangelicals and other Christians, not just evangelicals. I mean, it's Roman Catholics. There's, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews, anyone else who holds that the Bible is an authority. um, I felt they needed to see the other side to realize, ah, I can actually, there's a view of the world where there's a real Adam and Eve. Like that's, BioLogos has got real problems. If you have evolutionary theory, you have a major problem having a single Adam and Eve. Without spoiling the movie, what is an example of one of the natural things that was discovered in the movie that, you know, everyone thinks would take millions of years, but could have happened incredibly quickly? Well, I mean, let's just take the carving of the Grand Canyon. So that's a super interesting one because that would be a view that, you know, the many people will hold. Well, you know, you've got this tiny river that basically carved this canyon over millions and millions of years. And one of the observations that Steve Austin, Dr. Steve Austin, geologist, early on, his idea was, is that, hey, I think that, you know, something like could carve out this canyon and then Mount St. Helens erupted. Someone said he was one of the luckiest geologists that Mount St. Helens erupted the year, same year his PhD thesis came out, which was on the floating log mat formation of coal. And so he began to study Mount St. Helens. And of course, peat was created very, very quickly at the bottom of the lake there. Within five or six years, peat was already there. And usually people say, you know, coal beds create millions of years. And Steve was able to demonstrate, well, this is in less than a decade. We've already got the, the, the you know, the forebears of coal. Many things, the idea of a stratified forest he demonstrated there, you know, which they actually changed the signs in the petrified forest, because he was able to demonstrate that actually this is probably much more likely a catastrophic event. The formation and the carving of all of those canyons there in a day with from a mud flow. The, what he what the geologist recognized was catastrophism, a view that most of the formations in the earth that many people have argued take you know millions of years actually can happen very, very quickly. And so that's just a quick snapshot of all the different, you know, of a, few, a handful of different things. And there's, there's, you know, just limitless of these things well, that can be looked at in a different way. I wonder if the friends and family of these scientists said they were catastrophizing the bad joke. Oh, well, no, that, that, was, uh, that was surprising to me is that, you know, um, these processes, that, again, should take millions of years are possible within just a few years. So you think, hmm, what really happened? It's it's a different way of looking at the world, but that's what I think a lot of this does is that I one of the things that was important to me is is having synthetic views that are comprehensive. 
And I feel that a lot of people don't realize they have to kind of piecemeal views. So for instance, it's a very, I mean, what I mean by this is that there is a history where the events have to work together in terms of duration and uh, cause and effect of events. Like, for example, if someone said, yeah, World War II took 100 years, everybody would be like, what do you mean? Well, if you say it's like 100 years, that means you've got to have events that fit into that. And it actually is a structure that means that you, it's not just a five-year event or you know six starting from 39. It means it actually takes time. Or if you say it happened in six days, well, then that, that, that changes the time event and the time horizon. All the events in the what I would consider the um, conventional view, a very old, you know, 4.56 billion year old Earth and a you know, 13 plus billion year old universe. There are events that have to cohere to that time horizon. And the uh, same goes for if you're taking saying that it's less than 10,000 years. And the question is, you begin to look at things as a history has to all fit together. So then you got to lay, lay in biology, you got to lay into fossil record, you got to lay in geology. And most people, these are overwhelmingly too much information to put together. So they can kind of only look at kind of one thing at a time. And so when they they view things, they don't see it as a whole. And so what fascinated me about this view of a Genesis as a historical book was that the coherence of all the pieces suddenly was very, very interesting. That, to me, was the power. Is It's it's kind of the consilience of induction. It's not one thing, but it's many, 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 many things adding together that all of a sudden you're like, wow, that actually explains a lot. Yeah, one one thing I saw, I went to the, um, the Creation Museum in Kansas a couple of years ago, and they talked about radiocarbon dating, or dating, sorry, radioactive dating. And it looks like there's a huge hole in the half-life, the available radioisotopes that would that would allow us to date various processes more accurately. You know, what, what do you have to say about um, about radiocarbon dating? Did you that know, play into the movie very much? Yeah, it did. So we worked with Dr. Andrew Snelling, who this was, A- Andrew Snelling is a Australian geologist. He actually did his PhD work on uranium and was part of an international team. And this is not you know, Christian, he was a part of the conventional, or he just, it was a governmental agency for Australia that worked with an international team on uranium and other areas of radio. He wasn't working with radioisotope dating. He was just working basically with, with these types of ge- geological substances. The point is he took his knowledge and he's the one we interviewed for this and began to apply it. And so he's noticed a series of anomalies that basically are hard to explain if there is a consistent half-life as basically, you know, of uranium or potassium, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what you're looking at. There are a number of different these, I think it's uranium lead, obviously C14, and a number of over the of the deep time stuff. The anomalies are significant and there are multiple ones. Now, I would say the creationists would be the first day. We, we don't have a really good explanation of why there these anomalies are there, but the anomalies should give us pause to say that we can hang our hat on all of these of the earth being that old and so that's what i would say is i would say they presented more of a negative argument as opposed to a positive in that regard um and just saying that i think that that this is not probably a reliable dating mechanism and so i would always encourage people to go look at andrew snelling's work we've got a lot of his videos online where he digs in the specifics because I mean, I'll be honest, the, the radioisotope stuff, as it started to get into the mathematics and the molecular biology were two areas that I would always like, okay, this is probably more than I can totally understand. So I'll quickly move people over into the PhDs and say, go talk to these guys that they got their degree in it. What, what, um, how did it change your perception doing his Genesis history? When it started, what did you think? And when it ended, how did it change for you? Your thoughts? You know, I, I think my awe and my amazement at the world really grew. So I'm a runner and I used to go run. I still remember that I'd run in my, in the morning with my dog, she's a lab. And I would look at the dog and can kind of see into how all of her body worked. Like you watch her muscles and you watch all the way that, you know, she has all these systems inside. They're just working perfectly. I mean, I could throw a ball and she can grab it out of the air. And it's like, so how do you do that? All the muscles, all your eyes, everything works together. 
we would go and I'd look at a tree and you look at how the leaves and how the chlorophyll works and you look at how the structure, the fractal structure of how all of the uh, branching of just a tree and you see it everywhere. You can look at the atmosphere. So I began to be intellectually overwhelmed with the complexity of the world. And that's what I would say is I began to realize just how little I understood about anything. And so I would find, I thought it it was probably a very humbling experience where I began to have great awe at the way God had created the world and really reflecting on just how, as a creator, he did things so incredibly well and so purposeful for our enjoyment, for our health, for our, for everything we need. So anyway, that was probably my takeaway was just an, an amazement at the world. Yeah. I've, you know, I've done literally about 3,500 interviews with different people on, you know, humans can't even recreate an organelle inside one cell. And the amount of complexity is like, it's, it's stupefying. I, I remember I interviewed Dennis Noble, who's, you know, who's been in biology for like 60 years. He said it was estimated that there are 10 to the 70,000 possible interactions inside of an average person. And it just made me laugh. The number is so absurdly huge. It just, it, it literally made me crack up laughing. It, it is. Like it. And we live like this every day. I remember when, you know, listening to Rob Carter, Dr. Rob Carter, talk about the four dimensional genome. And it was it, it was so overwhelming. I think it was it's probably very similar to the sense of, for people who've gone to the Grand Canyon, you stand at the edge and it's all it's overwhelming. You cannot take it all in. It's so big. And I, and I think that is, in a sense, what God is. That's the reason why there's a doctrine of general revelation is that you can look at the world and know something about God. And it says why, you know, you you you, you can understand something from the cre- of the creator by looking at the creation. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. Stupefying is exactly the right word. So what is the new documentary about that you're working on? So the new documentary is called Mountains After the Flood. And what it is, it looks at some research Andrew Snelling was doing um, in the Grand Canyon at these enormous folds. And most people don't realize that they're there, but along the eastern side of the Grand Canyon and actually throughout, there's, I mean, folded rock that is 10, 20 stories, 50 stories high, enormous folds. And they are looking at these folds and trying to say, well, when did this happen and what caused it? Um, And so what the new documentary starts there and builds into the world well, builds into this, the area of geomorphology, the shape of the earth. How did we get the earth that we currently have? And how was that a result of the flood? And so we'll end up looking at all sorts of areas that a lot of us take for granted, but from the mountains all the way to the river valleys, to just basically what the world currently looks like. And Again, a lot of it is the arguments are is that catastrophes are a good explanation of how we got what we have. And so the documentary essentially looks at a research project and how creation science works, um, starting with the Bible, but then getting in and digging into really specific scientific, in this case, geological thin sections and examining the mineralogy of rocks and to say, you know, when did they form? How did they fold? And then using that as an example of how essentially these creation scientists come up with models about the formation of the world that work in accordance with Genesis. Are you far enough long where you've, you've, you've reached the conclusions on the folded rocks and, you know, without spoiling it, are you able to share anything? No, no, no. Yeah. There's no spoiling it. Andrew has already been releasing his research. You can see it on his, the answers research journal. Yeah. I mean, their argument is that when you look at these folds under the microscope, um, I mean, you can look at them what's called macroscopically, and it looks very much like these are very smooth folds. But their argument was, a conventional argument was, well, there's got to be probably some metamorphism. There's got to be some uh, level structural change inside the rock that would be different, say, where these rocks are folded. And some of these folds are like 180 degrees, solid rock, versus an area that's unfolded. And so they basically took Samples of rock where it's, uh, you know, the peat sandstone, it's totally flat, unfolded. Then they took samples in the the elbow of the fold, uh, the the point at which there'd be the most pressure. And they looked at them, you know, under the microscope. Basically, they created a thin section, which is about 30 microns in uh, thickness. And you can look through the rock and they studied it. And basically, the argument was that there's really no difference between any of these samples. 
substantially. And, and there's no evidence of metamorphism. And so the it would stand to believe that or stand to reason that these sediments were all down simultaneously and they were folded at about the same time while they were still ductile or soft. And the ability for them to fold when they're soft is that they then would not have any microscopic evidence of any kind of metamorphism, which is what we see, which would then mean that it lithified or hardened after it had been deposited. And so yeah, I mean, it's it's a fairly, I mean, we go all the way to look at the microscopic slides and look at all this stuff, and it's it's a pretty cut and dry argument. We show everybody and say, okay, there it is. Anybody can go online and read all of Andrew's arguments and see the pictures for themselves. So, How, how fast would the folding have occurred based on the data you see? You know, that's a great question. These guys would have probably said the folding would have occurred over weeks and possibly even months. But the idea is, is that many of these layers were laid down during the flood and would have still had water entrained in them at various places. They wouldn't have dried out. So what happens is you've got this question of how does God get the water off the continents? So, yeah, you've got these layers that have water inside, but then you've got water above them. Well, the way you get water off the continents is you raise the mountains up. And that's really an explanation of what's going on in the western United States. And so we focus particularly on the Colorado Plateau. But these are huge, huge areas. And uh, what's interesting is a lot of these areas, including, you know, the entire Western United States, would have lifted up in something called the Laramide orogeny. And so from a conventional viewpoint, this would have been in the Cenozoic, early Cenozoic, maybe, you know, 65 million to, say, 50 million years ago, maybe 40 million. These, these are loose terms. A creationist would say, no, no, this is happening at the end of the flood. And because it's happening at the end of the flood, it's happening over a very short, maybe a, you know, one year, maybe a couple of months time horizon where the wa- these things are being pushed up. The challenge that the conventional side has is that there, to them, there are over 300, well, that's not true. It's more than, so 30, 50 million to 550 million. There's like nearly 500 million years of, of of rock layers that have laid up that are then all folded simultaneously. So the problem is that how do you have a hard rock fold and fold all over places? I mean, you can find these all over the world, in this case, particularly the Western United States. How in the world would that have happened? And so they've got to have a mechanism and metamorphism is the mechanism. But when you look at all this, you begin to see, wow, that's a lot of shape and movement in the Earth's surface that happened to form what we see today. People that watch the movie, you know, the Genesis, the Genesis history, it's, I guess, it, does it propose a young earth creationist view or does it propose yes. um, some? Okay. So, yeah. So, so if you, what kind yeah, of feedback did you get from Christians on that? Well, I mean, there were so creationism, or there are only a handful of histories of the earth. And that was kind of what I often pointed out that there is obviously a, a view that the earth is, you know, 10,000 years ago, that there was a global flood that provided, you know, created a lot of the, um, formations and events that we see on, on the Earth's surface. Then there's our views of what would be con- uh, Christians who would hold to the conventional time scale of billions of years. And so you have in those group, go- those there are only two Christian groups that are two sides of that story. You have progressive creationists who then have to have, well, where did life come from? Well, it's actually 550 million years old, starting at the, you know, the Cambrian, but God had, you know, 20 to 30 progressive creation events. And he, you know, would create and there'd be extinction events and he would create and there'd be extinction events. And Cuvier starts this, he's a Frenchman. And right now, you know, reasons to believe folks hold this. And it's kind of a smaller group. They were not as happy with what we were doing. And then of course, theistic evolutionists would say, well, actually God just used evolution and they would follow the evolutionary timescale in terms of events. And notice what we're looking at here are differences in terms of time in differences in within the conventional view of terms of biological sourcing. You know, where did the creatures come from? Are they have a is there a lowest common ancestor or are they progressive create progressively created? And I would argue both those views have create a different series of problems with the Bible, but they also create a different series of problems with within science. And so they were not the folks that were theistic evolutionists and what I would call progressive creationists were not as happy with us in terms of our view of things. Which view uh, do you think is Genesis history support most of all? Like, well, what, what I would think be that, the age of the yes, earth and is it strictly so, biblical? 
Yeah. So Israel's history comes at this saying that the Bible is provides both a reasonable sequence of events and also provides a reasonable timeline. Now, I'll be the first to say that there actually are a number of ways of interpreting the scripture, including a couple different traditions, whether you're coming from the Orthodox Church uh, tradition, which holds more to the Septuagint time scale or timeline to the Protestants who hold more of the Masoretic and Roman Catholics as well, which is the basis of the Usher dates. But I would say the young earth view would say that the earth is, you know, no more than 10,000 uh, years old. And then some people will say, you know, 7,000, 6,000 and so forth. Um, I would probably hold to a little bit of an of a Septuagint view of things currently. But all that is, is that this is, everyone's in the same view that this is a recent creation and is certainly stands very much um, over and against a view that the earth is billions of years old. So it is a radically different timeline than the majority would hold. I don't know if, you know, if you can answer this, maybe the scientists would be, would be better, but what, what could happen that would really firmly be able to date, you know, the earth and, and the events on it and the, the creatures on it, et cetera. Would it be, um, you know, a new substance that can, that can do radiocarbon dating with a half-life that's more appropriate, let's say like a thousand years or, you know, what would, what would move the needle on this? You think, you know, it's a really good question because in looking at this, I think that one of the challenges we have as moderns and when I mean moderns, 20th, 19th, 20th, 21st century folks is our epistemology is assuming that there's some scientific, that, that science gives us truth that is, you know, can always be known everywhere. And so I think science has been confused first with the creation. People look at the world and say, well, that's science. Well, no, it's not. Science was something that man has created. I mean, to quote Paul Nelson. So the problem is that when you take an empirical view of the world and use it as your basis, then you're constantly looking at things, but you have to put it through a grid of a person. And so that's where I would say that is there something that you can scientifically prove things? I would always find that probably not, meaning in terms of science being the source of knowledge, because I actually don't think science gives us ever long term knowledge. That sounds kind of crazy, but I think the creation is 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 ultimately where truth is. And so although science can give us things that are more or less accurate, it has been proven to be demonstrated over and over again to be people that everyone thinks something is true only to find that it's not. And everyone will swear that they know this is the fact only to find later that it's not. And so I find that placing your epistemology on areas of history, we don't usually go to science to tell us about what's happened in the past in many areas. And so I think that there are other areas of knowledge that are equally as important and equally, you know, well, in some cases I would say superiorly. And that the Bible, I would argue, provides a superior epistemological structure for us to work off of. So the idea of finding, you know, a half-life or some, you know, element or even going and saying, great, we're going to go find, you know, some, you know, the joke is a rabbit in the Cambrian, as one uh, scientist said, but, you know, finding some paleontological evidence. My assumption is, is that people who don't want to believe it would create some scientific argument for why it couldn't be what it seems to be. And so that's, I think, so I, if that makes sense, there's a flaw in just wanting to think that we could even find something that that actually does do it. I don't think it's even epistemologically possible. Well, I know you can't make endless movies, but what, what, what other subjects do you think need to be tackled? I know you're only one person. There's only so much time, but you know, in addition to this new one on the Grand Canyon, like what, what ideally else would you like to do, you know, documentaries on what subject? Well, I mean, I, I immediately, it's actually kind of funny. You asked that. I just talking to some friends about uh, recently about, you know, there really needs to probably be one in kind of a true history of climate change and saying that if, you know, a lot of what we looked at this time, like we were in the Green River Valley, which is totally arid. It's in southwestern Wyoming. And yet it was used to be a lush lake. And this is enormous areas that are currently desert and arid used to be incredibly fertile. And I, I think that climate change, when you start looking at geology, is the it's the rule, not the exception. And so a lot of what people today are thinking about, you know, these that everything is is 
coming to an end or, you know, we're having an ice age is coming or et cetera, et cetera. All these doom and gloom. When you start looking at this from a biblical perspective, you're like, yeah, there was a heck of a lot more climate change recently than most people even realize. And I don't think that we are going to be able to throw ourselves into that, knowing what it took last time, you know, as in a global flood to make the climate really do crazy stuff. So that's a, a, a film that probably needs to be made. I'd probably would love to do a film on life after the flood. So if these are... There are a lot of things young earth creationists have not researched and it, they have a lot of things that we just don't know. And biogeography, how did animals get from where they are today backwards to the ark? What, who was on the ark? What wasn't on the ark? You know, looking and comparing the paleontology of the Cenozoic. These are all areas that I think really are interesting to me. And so, you know, at some point, perhaps I'll be able to, to delve into them from a documentary perspective. Yeah, I've seen like documentaries on the Exodus and a few other things on YouTube, and they seem to be really interesting and have very well supported, uh, you know, science. So I don't know if, if any of your efforts dovetail with those or, you know, learn anything from those or if other documentarians have contacted you guys and said, oh, you know, because you did the Genesis history, we're going to do that. And, you know, any collaboration suggested by other people? Yes. yes. Well, it is interesting. So my friend Tim Mahoney does all the Exodus stuff, and um, he's fantastic. I love Tim and his work. I have one of the long-term projects that I would like to do that would probably be much bigger than his Genesis history is really doing something on, um, is the Bible true? And so this is a project I've been working on for a number of years, kind of sketching out, and it would be bigger. I mean, we would need to partner with folks like some probably very large Bible foundations that would want to see this. But this is basically a history of how the Bible was written. And I like to say it goes from Mount Sinai, which is the first instance of inscripturation, you know, God writing the 10 words, the 10 commandments on rock, all the way to the modern iPhone, where a lot of people read their Bible today. And so the question is, how do we know that what we're reading on the iPhone really represents what God has said? And I think it's a really neat story that runs back 3,500 years about to showing how God has. Um, inscripturated his word and also uh, say, kept it safe and ensured in very interesting ways that it would be unadulterated. So that's another documentary series. That would be a very large series that when we can have time to focus on it, we will. Well, very good. What, um, so is Genesis history, is it just freely available on YouTube and this new yes. documentary? You know, where is the old one? Where is the new one going to be? And how can people get access and when? So the, yes, so Disney's history is on YouTube. It's on, I think it's on Amazon and Freebie. Uh, you can get it on uh, Tubby or Tubi TV. Um, you can get it, obviously buy it on our site. A lot of people want the DVD or Blu-ray are also our series beyond his Genesis history, which is basically all the interviews that we did. And we had another 15 hours of material. And then we have a whole conference that was another 70 hours, just lots and lots of material. Our new film will be released on our website and then potentially we'll get some, you know, we're, we'll look into seeing if we want to do some sort of distribution. It'll likely be on Amazon and a, and a number of other areas. To be honest, we're just right now trying to get it finished. So it has proved to be a little more difficult to edit for, we filmed it over three years. We started it during COVID. It's just been a lot, a very different process than shooting the first one. So the hope is it'll be finished by March. And then we'll we'll start releasing it. And, um, you know, it'll if you're on our website or excuse me, if you're on our email list, you can get it on isgenesishistory.com. We'll make sure everyone's updated. OK, oh, last question. Did you experience any censorship from YouTube or any other platforms you put it on or any attacks or was it, you know, we no, did you guys we haven't. I mean, the most interesting story we had was Wikipedia. And that was a fascinating. Somebody put us put our film up and I think you can go in there. You can actually see it. If you look at the background, it was a huge multi-year fight between various folks. I just kind of watched it. A lot of times people would put something and edit it and it became a real eye opener to the way Wikipedia works. It's sort of this pyramidal scheme of angels and demons and they're higher level folks that can always, you know, cancel out lower level ones. And so it was generally the evolutionists kind of won out on Wikipedia to give their view of what was in the, the film. And so that was the only time I would say it was really interesting to see how some people would say, well, no, this is just a presentation of what's being said. Other people are like, no, I don't want it to say that. 
And so that was probably it. We have not really received a lot of, I mean, people don't like it and complain about it and say, you know, negative things, but that's to be expected, whatever you do. So in general, there's been almost no censorship in that sense. But I think it's fair. I mean, it's a we, well, that's good. Yeah. yeah, my view is it's a free market of ideas, and I don't want to censor anything evolutionist or saying. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to censor anything that that progressive creationist or you know theistic evolutionist. Everybody should have the right to say their view and let people in the free market of ideas make their own conclusions. You know, yeah. say what, what is the most reasonable view, and that that's all I think is a is what we should be doing is having respect. They said Wikipedia. Wikipedia does not do that. I think people are not aware of how Wikipedia actually works. It's a, and I know that I'm not the only one that has found frustrations in various ways, depending on who has control of the editing of it. It's just a, it's an unusual world as opposed, it's not a, it's certainly not a free market of ideas in any way. Yeah. Well, very good, Thomas. It's been a great call. Um, so people should go to YouTube and, you know, bone up on, the Genesis history before the new documentary comes out. Um, what what do you think your timeline is for the new one? When's it going to come? You know, I really hope it gets released in March. That's what we're aiming for. It should be. It'll be late March, early April is what we expect. Um, and so we're just, you know, scrambling to get everything finished. These things are very complex and always take more time to try to keep things simple. And that's kind of where we are right now is finishing up animation and just polishing it so that it's it, it's clear okay well very good well again thomas thank you so much for coming on the podcast i really appreciate it absolutely thanks so much for the invitation it's been a lot of fun thank you for listening to the good question podcast please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast.